Good afternoon, good morning, good evening from wherever you join us. And a very warm welcome to this episode of the talk show series of Let's Talk Primary Health. I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Tony Dadeo. I'm the Senior Advisor for Primary Healthcare at the Center, at the European Center of the WHO, based in Almaty. And I have been passed the button from Melita Jacob, the head of the office. So, and today, what w- we would like to do is to ask our panelists on how to reflect on digital solutions that enable multidisciplinary approach and patient experience in primary healthcare. And for that, we've got an exceptional panel. So I'm going to introduce, to welcome them and introduce our panelists. So we've got with us, David Novillo is head of data analytics and digital health unit of the division of country health policies and systems of the WHO regional office um, for Europe. We've got Claudia Pagliari, Claudia, senior lecturer in primary care and director of global e-health research group from the University of Edinburgh. And at the same time, she is a theme leader in citizen-centered e-health at the NHS Digital Academy in the UK. Tatiana Trupetz, digital health expert and former deputy from the Health Insurance Fund of Croatia, and currently she is an international consultant. And finally, Kirill Soleski, he's a family medicine doctor. He's uh, also a program director at the Macedonian Medical Association. He's a founder and chief executive of a practice group called SEMET. And finally, she is an entrepreneur. So she's been developing some solutions like the M Health platform, thinking about the healthcare professionals and the patients. So I would like to say thank you to the panelists. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation and to be part in this panel. I'm going to give you a little uh, uh, snapshot of how this uh, session today is going to, to, to run out. So we are going to start with one hour of the panel discussion. Then after this panel discussion, we would like to continue the, de- the, the debate with you. And then we've created two breakout sessions, one in Russian and the other one in English, for you to raise questions, to uh, 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 share the experience you've got in this field. So that will be after the, the, the panel session. And finally, you'll see during the session that we've got a chat box. Please put your inputs, your suggestions, your, your ideas there. And even if you've got some references to share with the audience, it will be very welcome. And before uh, we move to the, r- uh, the first round, I would like to share and listen the voice of a patient. I would like, let's listen to Maria. Maria is a patient from a remote area in the region of Vesterbotten in southern uh, Lapland in Sweden. So let's watch together this four minute video and please, we can upload the video now. I am a 65 year old woman who lives in a small village. We are around 100 people living there. There are more villages in the area and in total probably about 600 or more likely 500 inhabitants in the area. It's located between Storuman and Tanabe in southern Lapland, a very sparsely populated area. I have always enjoyed being outdoors, walking in the nature and keeping myself in shape. But this became a bit of a problem 25 years ago when I had a herniated disc that was very hard to get back from. Since then I have been sensitive to strain and had pain in the entire musculoskeletal system. Because of this I have needed help with rehabilitation, help with my chronic pain, which is occasionally severe, depending on what I've done, how active I've been. And when you live in a distinctly sparsely populated area, 
there's a lot of travel in these contexts. So the digital tools and the development of those services have helped me really well. I have been able to reduce my travels. I have been able to meet, for example, the pain rehabilitation center digitally when we were to evaluate my stay there and talk to the team who were in Umeå. In that way I saved 640 kilometers round trip for a two hour consultation. So it was very valuable because the thing that has been stressing my back the most is sitting. And it is through the community room that the Center for Rural Medicine has developed in Slussfors. Another great service is what we call Elva Kutichu. You can reach it from home with a broadband connection or mobile broadband. You log in with mobile bank ID and can read your medical record digitally if you were too stressed when you met the doctor and don't remember what he said. So it's great to be able to keep track of that. Plus you can renew your medications, see which medications you've been prescribed and book appointments. Vaccine appointments, for example, for this thing with COVID. I would like to point out that this pandemic, which we have had now and may still have to learn to live with, has increased people's knowledge and attitude towards using digital forms of meetings and tools. What sounds most exciting is that if I needed to be examined, I would be able to visit the community room in Slussfors, connect and receive an examination by video. If there is someone with healthcare expertise, such as a physiotherapist in the room with me, and the doctor can watch the examination remotely and help so that the right steps are taken. Then, after a hip replacement, I have been training both before the operation and after with the mobile phone and an app. So I got messages every morning saying, do these two exercises today and it takes five minutes and then in the afternoon I got two exercises five minutes. For me, these digital solutions are a way to keep myself up to date on my health. If samples are taken, if I go through the last doctor's visit or health check, I am satisfied with the solutions that are available to reduce trips, give more time to daily exercise and taking care of yourself. But then much more can be done. The region's tools can be developed. And with this, let's start the first round. We have a very powerful story from Maria, because Maria interacted with a number of healthcare professionals. And at the same time, there is a very interesting equation here. So the healthcare professionals, different healthcare professionals, coordinated, talking with Maria with the support of digital solutions. And this is about what we are going to talk now. So I wanted to introduce the concept of multidisciplinary approach in primary health care. So and now I'm going to ask Claudia to have from her um, perspective, academic perspective, how do we understand multidisciplinary approach in primary health care? So Claudia, please. Um, I ask this question to you. Uh, Tony, um, uh, there can sometimes be a bit of confusion in the use of this term. So I'll try and unpick it a little bit for you. Um, the terms multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary are often heard in discussions about healthcare. Both refer to care provided by more than one type of professional with multi implying many and inter implying together although in practice they're often used synonymously. What we really mean is connected collaborative care centered around the patient's needs. Achieving multidisciplinary primary care can require new ways of organizing work. For example, moving from single-handed family physicians to group practices containing doctors, nurses, and allied health professionals. It also involves a willingness and a capability to collaborate with other parts of the health system, such as public health, specialist clinics, hospices, and social services for a truly patient-centered and preventive approach. For these reasons, shared digital information systems are essential prerequisites. 
helping to exchange relevant insights, coordinate and support holistic care and avoid errors and omissions. And this is particularly important for patients with complex conditions or for integrating health and social care for the elderly. Now we know that countries vary in the structure, funding and culture of their health systems and many are just beginning to establish services based around primary care. Digital health can aid their transition as well as helping to compensate for unavoidable gaps. For example, where resources or geography make physical multidisciplinary group practices difficult to achieve, shared electronic health records and digital or mobile communications can still support virtual interdisciplinary team working. The move towards telemedicine during COVID also showed us the benefits of three-way or even four-way communication between primary care, patients and specialists, which, which had already gained traction for remote and rural care and is now normalising even in urban settings for reasons of convenience as much as necessity. Um, until recently, the value of the data collected in primary care settings was underappreciated compared to hospital statistics, but the pandemic has emphasised that information collected by first-line practitioners in the community can be extremely valuable for understanding outbreaks and patterns of healthcare, and when fed into national health intelligence systems, can help to trigger and guide other types of health intervention. And likewise, in the longer term, Utilising this integrated primary and other sorts of data for understanding the social dimensions of health will help policymakers trying to increase health equity, as well as improving their own accountability through surfacing the types of inequalities that need intervention. And now, Tatiana, you have played a decisive role as a policymaker in Croatia, and unlike with the thinking about Maria and the story that she told. So what are the implementation uh, solutions that you've been contributing to deploy in Croatia from your perspective as policymaker? Please, Tatiana. Hello, Tony. Uh, so as policymakers, we were asked by doctors and nurses to give them tools to improve their everyday work their communication, their collaboration. So together with them, we were actually uh, implementing a lot of solutions. One of them is, for example, e-referral to hospital without a patient, which improved con communication and enabled consultation between primary doctor and uh, hospital specialists, and which kept patients on primary level. And uh, all, of course, improved uh, this multi multidisciplinary approach in uh, uh, caring for the patient. Also, we gave them gave them collaboration tools for peer exchange meetings, which were held within group practices once a month. So they were discussing one complicated case, learning from each other, which was very important. Also, uh, as uh, Croatia has 60 inhabited islands. We, had, we implemented telemedicine for early stroke detection on the islands where primary doctor was putting a patient uh, on, a, on some very good uh, high quality, quality camera and uh, communicating with neurologists in hospitals to be able to jointly solve the problem and uh, make early diagnostics. Also, we uh, gave some suitcases, well-equipped suitcases with uh, uh, ECGs, spirometers, and uh, many, many other equipment to field nurses, which uh, went to uh, rural parts of the Croatia, uh, communicated with the doctors, sent data to doctors, and uh, uh, we had uh, a possibility on this way to uh, prescribe therapy uh, sooner than uh, before. After implementation of all this and many more solutions, we actually recorded improvement in service delivery and higher satisfaction of patients and health, worker, health workers in primary health care. So, and now we are going to move to Kirill. Kirill is a family medicine doctor. He's got a wide experience in detecting and knowing what are the healthcare professionals needs, but at the same time, as a practitioner, he's been able to capture, to explore the patient's needs in relation to digital health. 
So, and Kirill told me that he was also, he's been knowing that, knowing the needs either of the healthcare professionals and the needs of the patients. He's been developing some solutions addressed to give response to these needs. So, Kirill, I would like you to expand a little bit on this because your experience, first sight, is so relevant in the development of new solutions. Kirill, please. Uh, thank you, Tony, for the introduction. And uh, I'm very honored and humbled to be part of this uh, panel and uh, to talk about this uh, very important topic. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has highlighted the need of to reinforce the primary care in North Macedonia and also has accelerated the rollout of key intervention under the primary health care reform declared right before the outbreak. Uh, this new model of primary care of uh, in North Macedonia is focusing for four four areas to improve the competences and role of the primary care doctors and also role of the nurses. And uh, second is to monitor primary health care inputs, not only in care, but also in disease prevention and health promotion. And to explore new model of case based on multi-profile teams and integration of health and social sector. In the meantime, digital solutions were quickly implemented to enable monitoring of the COVID-19 vaccination in patients and to reduce the administrative burden of the primary care providers by introducing e prescription, e referrals, and video and teleconsultation. Our national e health system is called Moi Termin, which, which is digital backbone of the, our health system. It's an integrated health information system that creates and stores medical records, data information related to the healthcare. Uh, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary team approach is very important when we speak about uh, patients with chronic conditions. They need a very complex and often require a multidisciplinary team approach. In order to enhance this uh, multidisciplinary approach uh, in primary health care, our association, Macedonia Medical Association, uh, in support with our partners, Ministry of Health, UNICEF, U USH, developed digital platform called the Ambulance. In this stage, we are working as a pilot program with specific new models in, uh, in our national health system with groups of GPs and specialists in different areas. They can use this model and exchange relative information about patient problem and condition, and the consultation can be finalized without presence of the patients in the GP offices or other clinics. In the same, this uh, program that I mentioned above with our partners, we're also implementing new another pilot for development of remote consultation in uh, primary health care in North Macedonia. We're using special inno innovative FDA approved devices that can make consultation in the home of the patient. So that's why we are uh, thinking, we are thinking that digital transformation, that's in, in this way, digital transformation is putting patient in the control seats of their own healthcare. So thank you, Kirill. Uh, thank you, Kirill. And now I'm, I'm going to ask a very direct question to David. David, what are the challenges of digital health from the perspective of WHO? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tony. Uh, so, um, as everybody knows, the, the European region has been heavily impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So, on top of the challenges that we already had implemented digital solutions, we need to consider the current and ongoing pandemic. So, um, based on our own experience, uh, trying to support countries in moving forward the digital health agenda, there is, I would like, I think that there are at least six uh, critical challenges at the country level, and I will just quickly go through them in, in one minute. I will try, I will do my best. So first of all is the understanding. So what do we mean by digital health? That is usually a challenge. So the first thing that the country has to clarity is about the scope about what digital health means. Another important is the vision. When you're referring to digital solutions, you need to have a long-term vision because having a quick win in digital health is not usually um, a good idea. Uh, the recurrent problem about the lack of funding. That is something that I think that every country is struggling because investing in digital solutions is quite expensive. What's about digitalization? So sometimes we are just looking at digitalization for the sake of digitalizing without knowing that behind the digitalization, we are referring to data processes. You need to ensure that the data processes are well established so then you can digitalize and have proper digitalized data processes. Um, 
also related to data that I just mentioned. And perhaps the most important is the lack of involvement of the user. So we need to ensure that the citizen and the health workers are part of digital uh, this digital health move to ensure that this is aligned to the final users. And just to mention one at the regional level, so I was just focusing on the at the country level. At the regional level, I think that we have this lack of that guidance and direction in the European region. And that is one of the reasons that the WHO European region has put forward an action plan that we will try to support countries and have this regional overview. Thank you, Tony. So and um, now I would like to, to transition to the round, uh, the second round. And what I would like to ask you is about your experience, your experience uh, with the heart of the different responsibilities either you've had or you have now. So I would like to start uh, with Tatiana. In the first round, we mentioned a few examples for enhancing um, multidisciplinary approach. And I wonder what are the key components, the supporting mechanism, mechanisms needed by governments to, for the successful implementation of um, digital solutions and to transform both the health systems and particularly primary health care. Tatiana, please. So uh, again, as policymaker, it is extremely important to have the strategy, to have vision what we need and what we have to do. Uh, also, the action plan needs to be developed. Uh, all this must be developed in uh, uh, cooperation with people working on the field and working with patients. So, I mean, doctors, nurses, field nurses, palliative teams, all of them who, uh, they, they must express what they need and then we must think of how we can cover it. Uh, the, one of the big issue while developing uh, the strategy and uh, uh, creating the vision, what what uh, we will do is uh, to to decide not to burden primary healthcare with additional administ admi additional administration by having uh, digitalization implemented in their offices in their practices every day. Also, we must think about legislation which uh, very often uh, slows slows the development. It's not, uh, it must support the development and implementation of all digital solutions in, in primary care and in general in e-health. Uh, next important thing is governance. Governance must be uh, clear and uh, communication between governance structure of e-health implementation and the, the patients and, and health professionals and institutions must be very clear. For example, in Ukraine, there is a, a, a very, uh, there is confusing uh, uh, strategy, what should be on national level and what should be on regional level when the country is big as that. Then uh, next thing is financing. Uh, we must incentivize the development of solutions. So, for example, we gave tools to family doctors to monitor their prescribing of antibiotics and to benchmark them uh, themselves in comparison with, with other doctors. Also, we incentivized if they are below the average of prescribing antibiotics. So what we get at the end, in six months, we had 8% less antibiotics prescribed which is not, in, not uh, uh, only important for Croatia, but much wider. So the policymakers must make decisions which are uh, improving the whole system, but also helping this uh, each and, and uh, uh, every uh, person working on the field. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. And now I'm going to, uh, to ask a question to, to Kirill. Uh, but first, I want to, to we know that uh, professional development and patient empowerment have been in, in, in the agenda for many years. And now the third element, the digital solutions, are playing a key role. And we should know how these have influenced, you know, the professional development, uh, the patient uh, experience and the patient uh, empowerment. And I know that you've been developing and you've been committed and involved in many initiatives. So please let's uh, share with us uh, a few of them. And I give the floor to you, Kirill, please. 
Yes, thank you, Tony. Uh, during the, this COVID-19 pandemic, families face massive disruption within healthcare, both directly as a result of the infectious disease outbreak and indirectly because of the public health measures to mitigate transmission. This led to a significant reduction of the health service delivery to patients. But this was also the reason to move forward with digitalization in North Macedonian healthcare. With support of, of WHO, a software for telemedicine option in uh, my term in national air health system was developed. Uh, Macedonian Medical Association in partnership with UNICEF and Ministry of Health. Uh, we roll out a series of training workshops to build the knowledge and skills of family doctors in effective use of this technology. We provide uh, with this uh, with these uh, tools, digital tool telemedicine. Uh, we GPs provide it. we are providing healthcare services uh, to those living in remote areas and vulnerable population, especially families and children with disabilities and family at risk. Uh, with the use of telemedicine, this pilot. Uh, uh, model we succeed to prevent unnecessary referrals, we reduce the burden of the healthcare system in some way, and also we spare families for financial hardsh uh, hardships of traveling to receive services and avoid crowded waiting rooms. So far, more than 300 family doctors participated in these workshops about uh, uh, training of telemedicine, focusing on three main areas, the principles of telemedicine, development of skills to, for effective communication, and also practical use of these uh, uh, digital uh, tools. Uh, but uh, in North Macedonia, as in many countries, uh, challenges in the form of regulation of payment regimes and also patient accept acceptance and sometimes doctors accept uh, acceptance remain. But uh, I think that any nation seeking to raise health care quality to increase access and uh, decrease uh, cost of the care should be expanding, not contracting the use of the, the virtual, virtual care. In the same time, last year, as a part of the first uh, A-Hackathon uh, organized by the Fund for Innovation and Technological Development and uh, with partnership with Ministry of Health, uh, I was uh, lead the team that produced a winding solution for e-health, uh, uh, call it M-Health, that is a smart, innovative platform that aims to integrate it and improve health health care services in our system in North Macedonia. Uh, this platform will provide greater efficiency and access to the health services to improve monitoring of patients with chronic diseases and to help to, uh, to help them to develop healthy habits and to increase awareness and self-care management. Uh, my own view is that primary care practices uh, had uh, central com is central component of digital transformation coordination, especially when considering the current challenges of the digital health in information that is fragmentation. Given this fragmentation issue and the emphasis of the primary care as a uh, central to improve health and to decrease overall healthcare cost. Um, I suggest that primary care practices should embrace their evolving role in this transformation and should seek to become digital health information hubs for the patients. So in the end, I think that continuing professional development in digital health must be uh, part of the training portfolio and in the same time patient needs support and training on how to use digital tools and doctors uh, needs to be able to advise patients how to use digital technology in conjunction with standard medical health so and, and now i'm going to uh, to ask a question to uh, to david david i'm sure the audience I uh, would like to hear about the WHO uh, plans on digital health. And uh, we all know that uh, in the coming weeks, uh, uh, there will be announced the, these plans. And uh, specifically, uh, just after the regional committee 72, where digital health plays an extraordinary role and is one of the key topic discussions for the 53 uh, member states of the Rio Joe. So, and D David, uh, what I'd like is, we, we are really impatient to know. We are really impatient to know. Uh, and could you just give us a taste before uh, the regional committee uh, that will take uh, place in Tel Aviv next week? David. Much, Tony, and it's a pleasure for me having the opportunity uh, to, to share what we have in mind about the action plan and the plans for the European region. So in the first part, we highlighted the challenges that we have for self across the European region. Then we have been working for a year with experts and then uh, member states plus 
relevant stakeholders to try to see how we can move the agenda, digital health agenda forward across the European region. Uh, some of you can say, uh, perhaps it's a bit late to put forward a digital health action plan in 2022, but regrettably is needed. And that is the reason WHO is putting this forward in the polit health political agenda. Um, what's new? First of all, we think that the digital technologies have great, um, gained credibility in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So everyone has looked at digital solutions to try to address the, the, the COVID, the challenges that COVID has put all of us. Also, why now? We have observed that uh, almost our countries are rebuilding and revamping their health systems. So this is an opportunity to digital solutions to contribute to this change and this transformation. Just as an enabler. So we don't need to look at digital solutions as the, the problem solver, but definitely digital solutions should contribute to this. And finally, why WHO should do that? So our main goal is to ensure that member states are working on digital solutions to achieve universal health coverage, protect public in times of emergencies, and enhance health and well-being. These are our three core pillars as part of the European program work, and we are fully committed to ensure that digital solutions are aligned to support these core pillars. About this action plan in particular, so we are proposing four strategic objectives, 18 regional focus areas, and 21 illustrative actions. I will briefly describe the strategic objectives. So first, our commitment is to continue contributing to develop safety norms and technical guidance. This is an area of work in which we need to continue developing guidance and norms. Second, to continue enhancing country capacities. Solutions, digital solutions are there, but we need to advise member states in how to make the best use of this at the country level. Also, continue building networks and uh, promoting knowledge exchange. When we are looking at communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, you can find a lot of evidence, guidance, networking. When it's about digital health, there is an important gap that we consider that we need to, to fill. And finally, very basic, to look at what is working and try to scale up at the regional level. I think that that is our commitments. And just to finalize, um, what adoption will mean for the region? So first, this action plan will contribute to operationalize the global digital health strategy that was approved in the World Health Assembly two years ago. Also means that we will continue enhancing country capacities. And also most importantly, this action plan that will go to 2023 to 2030, that we hope that will be adopted in the day one, next Monday, um, will allow us to have some actions, concrete actions, that we have committed to review every two years to ensure that this plan will be updated and up to date, knowing that this is changing all the time. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Tony, to share our plans for the region. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, David, and especially that uh, you are just giving, providing this information before uh, the big event in the regional committee. So uh, we really appreciate it. So, and, and now I'm going to move to Claudia again with, uh, with her heart uh, as a, a, an academic. And based on the comments and the uh, observations and the, and the uh, initiative that uh, uh, the other panelists have been exposed, exposing uh, during uh, the, this round, uh, Claudia, what are the, the digital health opportunities in primary health care. Can you just resume that, that all our colleagues have been mentioning, but from the academic perspective? Uh, thank you, uh, Tony. Happy to do that. Um, I, uh, I think I may just reflect on some of those policy messages that have come from our other speakers. And, um, you know, much of what we're seeing and, 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 and talking about reflects the sort of level of academic analysis that has been going on for some time as people try to understand uh, aspects of what works, what doesn't work, how to how to uh, create more resilient universal health systems and so on. And so one kind of key message I, I would say that comes out is that, that we need to include primary care in digital health strategies and digital health in primary care strategies because sometimes those are being left out. So bringing that together is very important and that recognition that primary care is, is a core pillar for strong health systems and universal health coverage and digitizing can help uh, that to, to be achieved. But we also have to acknowledge that digital health doesn't exist in a vacuum. 
For example, a health system reorganization which separates general medical practice from general dentistry is likely to hinder multidisciplinary data sharing and care coordination. So it's not just a one thing. Using data and predictive modeling to illuminate the potential consequences of these sorts of changes will be valuable, but we're still seeing differences between and within nations in the maturity and application of their information systems and infrastructures that make this difficult. And we also need clear national frameworks setting out how uh, agencies like public health can work with primary care successfully, as well as how they should share their data. And we also need a recognition of the value of digital health, as I've mentioned before, for universal health coverage and be careful not to, to, for it to fall into a, a means of extracting more out-of-pocket expenditure. And we're seeing more privatization and movement of services, sometimes from the state to the private sector. And while there is a healthy economy, uh, you know, is, is a good thing, we need to be very careful we are not extracting uh, uh, one from the other. So in practical terms, I mean, we've learned a lot about COVID, all the things that we sort of talked about for years as, as academics of things that might happen or would be a good idea or, uh, you know, experimented with in, in small settings have, have been taken forward, many of them, like um, telemedicine in particular. Um, and, but what we've also learned about is some of the unintended consequences that can follow from rash, uh, too rapid or over-digitalization. For example, we now have developed more understanding of important risks, such as uh, technology-driven clinician burnout, as well as the need to preserve compassionate, continuous and patient-centered care alongside automated or impersonal digital services that seem to offer efficiencies. And, and bitter experiences has also generated insights about the need for better information and alerting systems to avoid errors, neglect and harm when services are stretched. So we can apply that as we go forward. And likewise, there's been a, a recognition that social inequalities in digital skills and access to the Internet will exacerbate health inequalities if steps aren't taken to moderate this. So rushing headlong into digital first it may be risky and, and we're seeing much more realism about what was required now, and much more acceptance of hybrid models and choice uh, and, and an, an acknowledgement that this is going to be an evolutionary process. And likewise, you know, national platforms that integrate data from primary care and other sources can be challenging for patient privacy. And we've seen moves towards these recently, but without the necessary public consultation, which can lead to disruption and prevention of, of, of some of the, the benefits these may bring. So this needs to be done sensitively and recognizing that the achievement of the uh, sustainable development goals should take priority over any vested interest from, for example, academia or business. And you know, also our experiences in delivering the NHS Digital Academy also pick up on some of the other issues that have been mentioned around the value of offering time out for training, deep learning and networking, which has motivated and excited a new generation of digital health leaders. And they're able to capitalize on their networks and share their learning even after their formal studies. So integrating these sorts of experiences into normal primary care reaccreditation programs may be one way to, to have similar effects. Um, and as we've also heard, having the right skills and funding to properly evaluate and smartly procure technologies likely to deliver benefits and not just cost money is really critical. And that's another skill set that we need to grow. Thank you, Claudia. You've taken you've taken us so smoothly to the next uh, next round. So, and the next round is about reimagining the future of primary healthcare with digital solutions. And I'd like to start asking questions to all of you. Um, and beyond your current responsibility, let's think out of the box. And what? Uh, how do you see the future of primary healthcare? with the support, with the facilitation of digital solutions. And for that, I'm going to start uh, with David. And David, this is the question I'm going to, uh, to, to, to make you. So think even beyond the WHO uh, uh, perspective. Um, how do you see the future of digital health in primary health care? Thank you so much, Tony. So I, I will try to think out of the box, but I will be 
uh, very basic, but they call that the realistic, to make a reality check. So um, digital health should be seen as a genuine enabler to achieve health goals and not as the solution itself of health problems, right? Including, of course, primary health care. Um, digital solution already there. So when it's about technology, we have a lot of digital solutions that we need to continue exploring. So the problem is not about continuing developing new digital solutions, but as other colleagues mentioned today, is to strengthen governance, legislation, and policies. WHO, I, can, I have found myself in situations in which I can't stand to move forward with a super important innovative digital solution. And just because the legislation and the policy is not ready, they cannot move forward with that. So this is not about technology, but about what is around technology. That is an important message. And also five critical points, guidance principles that we are looking also, that we need to consider when we are looking at the future of digital health. One, we need to put the individual at the center. That is the top priority, to have a real future in digital health. Also, understanding the health system challenges and health needs. So if a country knows the health challenges, we should align the digital priorities with these health challenges, and not because we think that this is the latest innovative solution. That is also important to, to mention and to align. Addition, the need for policy decision making based on data. Right now, there is no data around digital health. So we are taking decisions around digital health without data. And that is the reason uh, um, WHO Euro is putting forward a monitoring framework, apart from this action plan that I just mentioned, in how to measure digital health. And we think that this will be also a game changer in how to support countries in measuring digital health to look at the future. Also, digital transformation to be used to reimagine the future of primary health care, but just as an enabler, again, so not just as the solution. And also to consider that the institutionalization of digital health requires a long-term commitment. We know that in politics sometimes we don't have enough time to establish these long-term commitments, but without a long-term commitment, it's impossible to, to move forward. And finally, I would just like to mention that the future of digital health in primary health care should be looking at the digital solutions and working all together beyond the health sector. And that is important to, to mention too. So I will keep it here. Sorry if I was uh, maybe not so optimistic, but for me, these are the basic when looking at the future of digital health in primary health care. Thank you, Tony. So thank you, David. And, and maybe uh, I'm going to, to move now to, to Claudia. And, and uh, I'm going to focus on, on two uh, key components here. One is what will be the role of the patients in relation to uh, primary health care in the future? And the second one is there will be new roles for healthcare professionals in primary health care because of the evolution of these digital solutions and the way the services will be uh, uh, delivered? Claudia, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, that was a, a, a very well made point. And uh, I think I'd like to start with that second point here. Uh, we know there's a global workforce crisis and that affects primary care as much as anything else. And we're even seeing primary care uh, clinicians in particular kind of disappearing from the system, sometimes due to other factors like uh, um, financial ones uh, or, or different levels of, of interest, fewer people coming through. But Irrespective, we we are uh, we are in a workforce crisis, and producing more doctors takes a long time. Even if governments invest in this, and um, and the workforce in primary care is going to be under pressure for the foreseeable future. And in this context, inevitably, we are going to see some tasks outsourced to automated agents like robots and chatbots. And uh, some countries are even flirting with the concept of retail primary care outsourced to digital kiosks and shopping centers supported by AI. Although the appropriateness and the safety of these approaches still remains to be seen. Now that might sound a bit dystopian, but it's important to remember that digitizing doesn't have to mean having fewer people in primary care, uh, even though there might be fewer doctors. Mobile technologies and clinical decision support tools can also augment the skills of lower trained workers. Nurses and community health workers are already performing expert tasks, and there may be an increasing role for technicians in the future, augmented by AI and other sorts of technology. But despite all of this, 
potential for the future. We are, through the pandemic, we've come to see a new recognition of the importance of human beings, of personal knowledge, of trust, empathy, and continuous care. And human doctors and other professionals working with them are the best locus of this. Now, as automation starts to reduce administrative burdens, hopefully those human beings will still be available to provide that more expert and supportive care. So this is what we would hope in an ideal world. Although some technologies are becoming better at replicating emotion and understanding it and perhaps reporting, uh, uh, giving advice in what seems like a human manner, and that raises other difficulties. So that's on the professional side. Uh, I think that's uh, important. In terms of the patient themselves, we are definitely moving towards more patient empowerment using digital. Some of that is driven by the patient. App stores are full of things that people are actually buying for themselves. Devices that they're buying for themselves, they're actually pulling it towards them. Sometimes it's being pushed towards them. For example, the prescription of wealth, wellness, wellness and health apps in primary care is becoming more common. Uh, likewise, people are being diverted more and more to digital first platforms when they're seeking appointments or when they're booking appointments, uh, you know, choosing them, for example, um, or even when they're being guided on things like rehabilitation. So there's more and more of this slight nudge towards it in a collaborative way. So I think we'll see more and more of that, particularly um, as personal health records become more established, more mobile, and more multifunctional. In the UK's NHS, for example, there's the NHS app, which is producing a small personal health record for the patient, but is also um, able to uh, help them to book appointments and download vaccine certificates. And as these things develop more utility for the patient, people will want to use them, people will find them useful. And, and I think that is critical. It's that it's got to be pulled by the patient. It's got to serve the patient's need. It's got to help them. Uh, because without that, people are going to feel that they are being deprived of human beings, just and, and which are being replaced with technology. And actually avoiding that is, is critical if we want to preserve trust in healthcare. So these are just some examples. And I think there's also some practical things, technological things. For example, the delivery of what we call, might call laboratory on a chip, diagnostic testing in primary care, where you used to have to wait weeks and go to a clinic and get a test and wait ages and ages and then get your result and then go back to your clinic, uh, your GP. It could all be done very, very quickly it, while the patient is there, speeding things up, removing stress and tension and increasing efficiency. So all of those sorts of things, I think, are going to help us. Okay. Thank you very much, Claudia. I'm very happy to, to, to hear that you, you've included in your reflections the humanistic approach as well. So this is, 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 is needed. And now I'm going to, to, to ask uh, Tatiana, uh, uh, from her point of view, uh, in, in, in how she sees the future, but I would like to focus on two things. I think what is possible and what is important for you, Tatiana, as a policymaker? Well, I will be a little bit more conservative than Claudia and maybe follow uh, David's words. We have to think about possible. So different maturity stage, different countries. Uh, we have electronic health records still a central and most important digital solution or tool or enabler for multidisciplinary approach uh, in primary healthcare and beyond. On this electronic health record, we can build everything else, e-referral, e-prescription, e-ordering, everything. But uh, we have to move from medical records in many countries, which are developed uh, on the institutional level, on the level of healthcare provider, we have to move to electronic health record, which is collaborative tool, which is then uh, information point for everything that is going on with the patient in, inside the, the health system. And then to move to uh, personal health record, patient record, which then can be a communication collaboration tool with the patient, where patient will be able to uh, jointly make decisions with their physicians. So this is the first thing, electronic health record as the most important. The second thing is teleconsultation. We still have uh, a lot of space to improve teleconsultations uh, on many levels. I will give some example like 
we can uh, put smart glasses in uh, uh, emergency vehicles for teleconsultation with primary healthcare physicians, uh, which then uh, can be done by some uh, uh, nurses or paramedics, uh, uh, anything that, that is usually done by doctor. So these are some solutions in teleconsultation which can improve healthcare delivery. The third thing I would put mHealth. Claudia already mentioned there will be reimbursement and prescribing of mHealth applications, but when we will be sure in their quality, of course, because now we are overburdened with mHealth applications, but they can significantly uh, help to, to monitor patients' health, uh, to doctors and to patients themselves. Also, I would put innovative digital solutions for NCD management as extremely important, risk stratification tools, and clinical decision-making, as uh, speakers already said. Finally, all types of e-learning are crucial for everything that we would like to, to do in digital, transform, digital transformation of primary health care. So, th thank you, Tatiana. And now um, I'm going to... We, uh, to, to uh, ask a question to Kirill, but uh, we started uh, uh, this talk show uh, listening the voice of a patient, listening the voice of Maria, and I think uh, to close the loop, it would be very good to listen the voice of a healthcare professional. So, what are the challenges you see in the future for the healthcare professionals, and in general for primary healthcare as well? Kirill, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, we are living now in digital age, which is reflected in our healthcare system, and that uh, imposes multiple risks and challenges. But uh, we, as uh, professionals, we need to overcome these uh, challenges to ensure that digital health uh, system is meeting the guiding, basic guiding principle of being for all, anywhere, and anytime. One of the biggest challenges that I see is the low level of digital and health literacy in the general population and especially in the elderly which is uh, one of the uh, main uh, challenges in this process. So that's why substantial efforts therefore needs to be made to normalize the use of the digital health on societal levels. These efforts should include uh, upscaling both health professionals and the general public through bread reaching educational initiatives. Also, uh, concerns have been raised about using digital health and how did this will increase or not existing socioeconomic gaps between groups of people who can easily access and use these such services and uh, those who cannot. At the same time, uh, social media is it's, it's a main, main challenge also in the same time because while playing a vital role in supporting communication between social and family groups during lockdowns, uh, social media has also made, uh, made it uh, considerably easier to spread medical misinformation across societies. And one of the main challenges is also ethical because as uh, digital technology we use in healthcare has grown in recent years, we have as a professional health professionals and also the patient have uh, many concerns about privacy, confidentiality, transparency, and also uh, data ownership, sharing and storage of the health, uh, health data that is collected. And one of the main challenges uh, in the primary healthcare is uh, access and workload. Uh, is this uh, using of digital technology will increase workload because some of the studies suggest that non-face-to-face -face, uh, consultation may, may actually increase demand for uh, urgent face-to-face -face consultation. And also uh, GPs are using a very different uh, form of uh, interaction with the patient, like telemedicine, teleconsultation, email, text messaging, social media. This new way of working requires GP to self-direct or manage workflow and understand where and uh, how to set boundaries around continual patient access. Uh, training should be thus emphasize this, uh, how to manage digital uh, vocal. But uh, I think that digital transformation is a uh, fundamental reality in the, for the health for the health uh, care today and I think we must embrace embrace it. So uh, thank you, thank you so much, uh, uh, Kirill, thank you so much to our panelists for this very interesting uh, discussion we've had. And uh, I would like just to, to wrap up two, two key ideas. I think uh, uh, digital transformation should be going along with the 
uh, transformation of primary health care. They cannot go on different sites. And secondly, I think digital, uh, digital health is an added value for primary health care. And now I would like to, to conclude and to, and to finish uh, this panel debate, um, um, sending some of, the, uh, the some of the messages. One of them is that there is lots more to discuss. And because of that, we offer you to join us to the deep dive sessions to, f to continue this discussion, either in one, uh, in, in one deep dive session, in one break, uh, breakout room in Russian, and you can choose the one in English as well. You'll see the information and in the, the links in the chat box. This uh, information will be uh, in, 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 in the website for, for a few minutes, so you, uh, you don't have to rush to click, but uh, this is what we are, we are offering now. So another thing that we are asking you is that if you can, once we, we finish this panel, uh, uh, panel session, that you, uh, if you kindly uh, fill the survey that we are going to, to, to upload uh, on the screen. And thirdly, and this is a reminder, uh, and, and uh, David Novillo is already mentioned, uh, one of the reasons of this uh, talk show on digital health and primary health care is because next week there is the Regional Committee 72, and one of the key topics will be digital health. And this, for sure, will impact life of many, many of the citizens of the WHO European region. So this is one of the key messages. This, the continuity of this discussion will happen with the practicality and, 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 the, and, and, and the, the real uh, 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 solutions that WHO is going to, to upload and to discuss and to approve uh, in, the, in the next uh, regional committee. And finally, uh, I would like uh, to thank you all, uh, the ones who have uh, been panelists. I would like to thank you, the technicians behind me, the team uh, from the, the WHO Center for Primary Health Care, that they've been working behind the scenes. And I would like to thank you, you all, and we are looking forward to seeing you in the next episodes of the talk show. So thank you very much. And now don't forget to fill the, the survey. And the second thing is please, the ones that you have time and you can join us, the discussion is continuing. So thank you very much until the next talk show episode. Thank you.